All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, and uh, others may be, may be joining as they sign on this morning. Um, so welcome, welcome to our seminar today on the Global Fund's seventh replenishment. What is it and why does it matter? We're happy to have so many of you here uh, from our IGHS community. Welcome to our executive director of IGHS, Jaime Sepulveda, other IGHS leadership, including George Rutherford. Um, I see we have members of our wider global health community, including Dr. John, John Chamwamwa from the, the executive director of the Elim Elimination Eight in Southern Africa, as well as Dr. Karine Karema, the interim CEO from the RBM Partnership to End Malaria, uh, as well as other friends and colleagues uh, from, from around our community. So welcome, one and all. We are very, very pleased to see all of you here uh, for, this, for this seminar. Uh, so we're here today for a conversation with Sir Richard Feacham about the seventh replenishment of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria, and why it matters. Since its launch in 2002, the Global Fund has invested over $53 billion, including $24 billion for HIV, almost $8 billion for TB, and nearly $14 billion for malaria, saving 44 million lives and reducing the combined death rate from HIV, TB, and malaria by more than half in countries where the Global Fund invests. The Global Fund raises money in three-year cycles called replenishments. Countries, companies, and foundations will gather in New York September 19 through 21 to announce their contributions for the seventh replenishment. The stakes couldn't be higher given the COVID-19 pandemic, future pandemics, climate change, and conflict as well as plateauing progress and investments in the three diseases. While clearly the Global Fund has had transformative impact, why should we, as IGHS and members of our broader global health community, care about this replenishment? I have a couple of slides to help answer this question. In 2020, Global Fund contributed 12% of total financing for HIV, 16% for TB and 42% for malaria, with domestic resources funding the majority of the HIV and TB responses. US bilateral funding is also significant for HIV and malaria. Of total donor financing, the Global Fund contributes 25% for HIV, 77% for TB and 56% for malaria. Consider the work we do as IGHS across these three diseases. <clears throat> Global Fund is the major donor for malaria and significant donor for HIV and TB. The success of the Global Fund directly affects the context in which we operate and collaborate with our partners around the world. An unsuccessful replenishment could have detrimental impact on our country and regional programs and jeopardize hard-won gains. The Global Fund estimates that a successful replenishment would save 20 million lives, cut the death rate from HIV and TB and malaria by 64%, and build a healthier, more equitable world. This is the context in which we can maximize the impact of our work and our partnerships. I am pleased to have Sir Richard with us today to describe the origins and early years of the Global Fund, the evolution of the replenishment process, and the prospects for the upcoming seventh replenishment. While many of us know him, I would like to take the opportunity to briefly introduce Richard. Sir Richard Feacham is Professor Emeritus of Global Health and Senior Advisor to the Malaria Elimination here at the UCSF Institute for Global Health Sciences. From 2007 to 2021, Sir Richard was the founding director of the Global Health Group at IGHS. And from 1999 to 2021, he was Professor of Global Health at both UCSF and UC Berkeley. Most pertinent to today's seminar, Sir Richard served as founding executive director of the Global Fund and under secretary general of the United Nations from 2002 to 2007 while on secondment from UCSF. Prior to that, Dr. Feacham was director for health, nutrition and population at the World Bank and dean of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Professor Feacham holds a doctor of science in medicine from the University of London and a PhD in environmental health from the University of New South Wales. So Richard, we look forward to hearing your deep insights and reflections on the Global Fund, past, present, and future, and why this upcoming replenishment should matter to all of us. 
Following Richard's talk, I will open the floor to reflections and discussion from all of you. In the meantime, please feel free to put any questions into the QA box as they arise, and I will be monitoring that throughout Richard's talk. So Richard, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Alison, and uh, good morning to all the Bay Area participants, and good afternoon, good evening to those who are elsewhere around the world. Um, good to see this strong interest in the Global Fund and the upcoming climax of the lengthy replenishment process. Now, I'm guessing that the majority of people with us this morning are under 45 years of age. Um, and if I'm wrong, probably only by a small margin. And that's kind of interesting because if you're under 45 years of age and you work in global health, you have never worked in a global health ecosystem which does not include the Global Fund for AIDS, TB and Malaria. And so you may sort of take for granted a little bit or assume that life has always been like this, but it certainly hasn't, as those of us who have a, a bigger span of global health experience can attest. And I'm gonna start therefore with a little bit of history, uh, mainly because that history is relevant to a number of dimensions of the replenishment process, including the current seventh replenishment. And I'll start by pointing out that in the late 1990s, the creation of something like the Global Fund was a far-fetched idea. I think if you've been a betting person, you would probably have betted against the creation of, of that particular new animal. It was an audacious idea with an uncertain outcome. And if we could go to the first slide, Alison, please. The next one, yeah. Thank you. So the Global Fund in the late 1990s, an audacious idea with an uncertain outcome. The proponents of whom there were many uh, argue that we urgently need a new large, and $8 billion per year was a often spoken about uh, ideal size, independent financing agency focusing on three diseases, HIV, TB, and malaria, with much of the earlier discussion focusing on TB, on, on sorry, HIV, of course. But there were skeptics, many skeptics, who really challenged every dimension on that. Uh, new, why is new a good idea? Why can't this be part of the UN or part of the World Bank? Will, will, trans will transaction costs, particularly at the recipient end, uh, skyrocket as a result? Large, uh, 8 billion per year, what about absorption capacity? Independent, what about this new and rather innovative governance scheme that's being proposed? Financing, will, not, will that not be disruptive in uh, low-income and middle-income country uh, governments and will ministers of finance simply substitute between domestic resources and uh, global fund resources and focusing on three diseases obvious concerns about distorting priorities and whose priorities are these anyway and in addition to that of course national denial was still widespread as it was through into the early years of this century and countries which were simply uh, burying their head in the sand about the threat of HIV and what the epidemiology was likely to look like in their country would of course not support the creation of a special fund to tackle HIV primarily in Africa. But however, and nonetheless and remarkably I think, um, the Global Fund was born in 2001 and into 2002. And I think this is primarily because of uh, two, two factors in particular. One, the horrendous nature of the HIV pandemic uh, on the front line and thinking especially about uh, Southern Africa, Zimbabwe and southwards basically. Uh, you, you remember how bad things were um, life expectancy going back to levels not seen for decades and decades. Coffin makers couldn't make coffins fast enough. The fabric of society and the civil servants, the military, 
the judiciary, the teaching professions were being hollowed out. It was catastrophic, it was cataclysmic. And the fire was burning, the house was burning down, and there was no fire brigade in sight. There didn't seem to be anything uh, on the table that would seriously attenuate the crescendo of the, of the pandemic. And the second, I think, big motivator for the creation of the Global Fund was this extraordinary array of very diverse people, events, um, drivers, if you like, of the creation of the Global Fund. They were numerous, they were diverse, and they were highly aligned in what they were asking for or demanding. So perhaps with the next slide, we can look at some of those key drivers. So here I've picked six key drivers of the early, early days, looking at the birth and rapid initial growth of the Global Fund. And these are my top picks, if you like, my six. The full list of drivers is much longer than this. And this is a good thing. This is one reason why the Global Fund did get born and did grow so rapidly, is it had very many supporters, very many owners, very many parents, really. So a quick look at those six. Some of them will be very familiar to you. The first one is uh, France, way out ahead. December 1997, President Jacques Chirac and Health Minister Bernard Kouchner, who you may also know as the co-founder of Médecins Sans Frontières. So Chirac and Kouchner in Abidjan, December 1997, making a very important speech, which specifically called for an international therapeutic solidarity fund to bring access to antiretroviral drugs that was then developing in Paris to that same level in Africa, including rural Africa. And interestingly, um, following that speech, um, a, a, a letter from President Chirac to Jim Wolfenson, the then president of the World Bank, landed on my desk, because I at that time was the director for health, nutrition and population at the World Bank. Um, and it was Chirac writing to Wolfenson saying, would you help take the lead in creating this Solidarity Fund for Therapy. And there was a typically Wolfensonian handwritten comment on it saying, Richard, up to you, but please don't upset France. Um, now, I wasn't about to upset France. Um, so we worked on this and probably to our eternal shame, we wrote back to the French government and said that this was a very far-sighted and foresighted idea, a uh, brilliant idea, but it was ahead of its time and that the current complexities, expense, uh, need for clinical oversight and other factors uh, made this hard to envisage at the current time. But the time would come when we would all want to do this and we'd be sure to work closely with the French government in making sure that happened. Little did I think at the time that just three years later, the Global Fund would be born and would quickly become a major financer of antiretroviral therapy uh, across, across the world, including in Sub-Saharan Africa. So looking elsewhere on the, oh, well, I'll come back to France in a moment. Looking elsewhere on the list, uh, Kofi Annan, important influence, um, several years of lobbying for an Africa fund to fight HIV, and indeed making a personal contribution, the first, uh, to the Global Fund in very, very early days. Thirdly, which I've already mentioned, the reality on the, on the ground, the sort of cataclysmic scenario, especially in Southern Africa, which seemed to have uh, nothing, but, um, nothing but bad news and only worsening, 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 I think was a strong motivator. Activists, I can't understate, and in San Francisco we should know a lot about this, I can't understate the role of activists North and South, from the wild and angry, and they had much to be angry about, uh, to the sober and more analytical uh, activists North and South had a huge impact. And there's a picture there of Zaki Ahmad from South Africa, one of the leading activists globally and in Southern Africa, who many of you may know of or know. Then, fifthly, the early movers, 
the fact that some countries, either governments working with NGOs, like in Thailand, or NGOs getting out into the lead with governments dragging their feet, as in South Africa, began to prove that big things could be done, began to prove that it wasn't hopeless and that you could do all manner of things to prevent and treat and attenuate this dreadful pandemic. And that was inspiring, I think, to everyone else. Um, in the case of Thailand, there's a picture there of Dr. Richai, Mr. Kondong, um, the, the wonderful Thai minister who always toured with many condoms in his pocket, which he would wave with glee and speak very frankly about the sexual transmission of HIV and be a, a tonic in a part of the world where there was still uh, a good deal of kind of uh, cultural immunity being claimed. Uh, we can't suffer from this pandemic because we have a culture that will protect us from it. And lastly, um, George W. Bush in the Rose Garden, May 2001, with President Obasanjo and Kofi Annan, pledging 200 million for a global AIDS and health fund, which should grow in his opinion to be $8 billion per year in size. And that speech was extremely important uh, and the supporting remarks by Obasanjo and, and Annan in terms of really cementing US leadership in this whole process very early on and US leadership provided by a Republican administration, which also has been significant through time. We'll come back to that. And then just to note at the bottom, it's all about HIV. The Global Fund wasn't funded for TB and it wasn't funded for malaria. They've been great beneficiaries, but it was all about HIV. And without the HIV pandemic, there would not be a Global Fund or anything like that. So let's go to the next slide, please. And completing the history, um, the G8 then became the, the major actor. Uh, firstly, the G8 in Okinawa in July 2000 in Japan called for a new partnership on HIV, TB and malaria and asked for a detailed proposal to, to be discussed at the next meeting, which was the G8 in Genoa in July 2001. And this was an interesting G8 because hundreds of thousands of protesters, you may, you may remember, converged on Genoa and there was some incredible street fighting. 500 protesters were seriously injured and one was shot and then run over twice by a policeman in his police car. Despite this uh, outburst of rage against globalization and uh, the kind of agendas that the G8 was supposed to have. This was a meeting where there was agreement to create the Global Fund to be operating by the end of 2001 and a commitment from G8 members of an initial $1.3 billion. And it happened. And the reason I say don't hold your breath at the top of this slide is because most G8 resolutions do not lead to much of anything. They're quietly forgotten. But this one led to uh, the implementation of exactly what the G8 had called for, um, and I think some world-changing impacts. So a remarkable thing. The G8 envisaged a broad partnership, not just governments working with governments, but civil society, the private sector, and so forth. And um, excuse me. The, the G8 meeting further developed five principles which should guide the work of the Global Fund, uh, which uh, are very important. Science-driven, rapid resource trans transfer, low transaction costs, light governance, and focus on outcomes. And there was a big attempt, especially early in the life of the Global Fund, to respond to those important principles. Sticking with the G8 story for a moment, if we come to the next year, the year 2002, the G8 was in Canada. It mainly spoke about uh, education and the Global Fund was hardly discussed. I think it, it was just, it, it was getting underway, doing good work in Geneva and there was no need to talk about it. 
And then interestingly, interestingly, come to 2003, and the G8 was hosted by France in Evian, quite close to Geneva. And the Global Fund became important to that G8 because Chirac and Bush couldn't talk to each other because of the Iraq war. And um, it was a very frosty uh, environment between the US and France and between Chirac and Bush personally. Um, and you may remember that in the canteens in Congress and in government offices at that time, French fries were all formally redesignated as freedom fries. We couldn't call them French. But the Global Fund was the one thing that Chirac and Bush could sit in a room and talk about positively and uh, reinforce each other. Uh, Bush had quickly become the number one donor to the Global Fund and Chirac and France had quickly become the number two donor to the Global Fund. So they obviously agreed about a lot uh, of Global Fund issues and uh, were themselves the major drivers of the income side of the Global Fund and could come together on that topic. I think a very good example of global health diplomacy. Next slide, please. So let's come to the present day then and look at uh, income and expenditure quickly to get the size and scale of where the money is coming from and where it's going to. So if we look at cumulative pledges from 2001 to 2022, over the, over the first 20 years of the Global Fund. Cumulative pledges total around $73 billion. And the, the top sources of that money are listed here. Um, the USA in first place, and then France, UK, Germany, Japan, European Commission, Canada, and the Gates Foundation. So the Global Fund has very, very many sources of money. A few of them are very large and many of them are very small. And here are some of the very large ones. And the very, very large ones are across the USA and France and UK, which together make, uh, provide 55% of all global fund income. So there is obviously a big focus in replenishments on the big donors. The 33% figure is also important because the US has been pegged at 33% of global fund income from the beginning, which means that the US can provide 33% of total income in any year, but not more. It's happy to be less, but it can't be more. We'll come back to that. Um, other important points about this, uh, this uh, income, uh, sources of income slide, is that over 70 countries actually contribute to the Global Fund. A few of them, a lot of money, we see some of them here, most of them small amounts. And I've got three examples of some of those many other countries. China contributing 81 million, cumulatively, India 69 million, Zimbabwe 3 million. Uh, a number of low-income countries contribute to the Global Fund, modest amounts. But very significant in terms of, I think, solidarity and moving away from an aid paradigm to a global public goods paradigm, where we're not giving money charitably to other countries, we're collectively investing in problems experienced by humankind everywhere. Now, coming to the private sector, the largest contributor is, of course, the Gates Foundation at 3 billion, um, and nothing comes close to that from the private sector. In number two place in the private sector is Product Red, which many of you will be familiar. I, I hope everyone with an iPad or an iPod or an iPhone chooses the red variety. And when you do do that, half of all the profit goes straight to the global fund. So that's been a remarkable uh, innovation launched in 2005 uh, in Davos by Bono and Giorgio Armani and Bobby Shriver and me. Um, and it's been very successful. And if you look at the Product Red website, you'll see all sorts of uh, interesting products, including a rather cool red Vespa scooter. And I think you can get a red Jeep these days as well. Anyway, interesting uh, picture, uh, but one of the main messages is there are 
a few sources of most of the money. And so obviously replenishment will focus on those sources a good deal. Let's go to the next slide, please. So where does the money go to? Well, cumulative investment thus far has been about $60 billion from 02 to 22. And that is broken down by disease target, as you see on the left. Um, in more summary form, there was a very early consensus um, that the global funds money should go about 50% to HIV, about 20% to TB, and about 30% to malaria. And what you see there is a somewhat different way of expressing roughly those proportions. Now, in terms of the geography of the recipients, um, a large number of countries are supported by the Global Fund, as you know, for HIV, TB, and malaria, or one or two of those, not necessarily all three. And well over 100 countries are supported, but a few countries receive much larger amounts. And that's uh, most notable for Nigeria, which has cumulatively received nearly $4 billion. And coming in the next level would be the Congo, Ethiopia, India, and Tanzania that have received around $3 billion in the first 20 years of the Global Fund. Now, these are very significant numbers, obviously. And in some countries, uh, have a significant influence on the financing of the health sector. They're big enough to be important in managing health sector finance. Tanzania is a good example of that. Global fund and cumulative uh, resource flows to Tanzania have equaled about 40% of the government's total health sector spending over the same period. So that's a very significant inflow of funds into a relatively underfunded healthcare system. Um, and of course, those funds focused on three diseases, HIV, TB, and malaria. So next slide, please. So the replenishments um, in the initial startup period, 01 to 05, which you see bottom left, there was no replenishment system. And we operated on an ad hoc, ad hoc basis, basically knocking on, do knocking on doors. And by knocking on doors, we raised 5 billion in that first four year period. And that was useful because prior to establishing a formal replenishment process, because it allowed other donors that had previously been uh, not part of the discussion to come to the table and to become long-term contributors. And a very strong example of that is Australia, who initially didn't join the Global Fund or wasn't associated with it, but during the startup phase became an enthusiastic supporter as it learned more about the intentions of the Global Fund and the commitment of the Global Fund to invest in Australia's backyard, i.e. Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, etc., which was their main concern. They thought it would be an African fund and therefore it wasn't of interest to in Australia. So it allowed those sorts of discussions to go on. It also allowed us to sort of test the hypothesis that we were talking billions, not millions. And again, back then, I mean, today we're very blase about talking about billions. But back then we were, we were stuck in the world of millions. And as Jeff Sachs pointed out, it was only around the turn, the turn of the century that we changed the M language to the B language. And uh, at the Global Fund, as I mentioned, we raised five billion in the first uh, uh, startup period. So clearly establishing that we were talking billions. Then you get replenishment one, two, three, four, five, six, shown with the blue numbers down the bottom. Initially for a two year period, 06, 07. Then from then on, from replenishment two onwards for three year periods, which is where we now are. Um, annual levels of expenditure based on that rate of fundraising. Initially, 1.25 billion per year, jumped to 2.5, doubled to 2.5 in 06, 07, 
then for the next two replenishments, numbers two and three, about 3.3 billion per year, moving up to four during replenishments four, five, and six. And as we'll see in replenishment seven, an attempt to get expenditure up to uh, six, uh, I'm sorry, up to, uh, yes, up to six uh, billion per year. So that will give you a flavor of how that has worked. And of course, when we talk about replenishment, there is uh, a formal um, pledging conference, which is like the flagship of a replenishment round. Um, and for example, replenishment one had preparatory meetings in various places, but then the formal flagship uh, pledging conference was in London in September 05, hosted by Tony Blair, chaired by Kofi Annan, um, and drove double the Global Fund annual income from 2.5 to 5. Um, and that process that goes on between the formal pledging conferences is, of course, incredibly important. Large donors or even small donors will not donate unless they're heavily involved in the strategy, agree with the numbers that are on the table, and feel part of the whole process of deciding what the priorities and way of working of the Global Fund is. So a lot of work between meetings. So next slide, please. So now we come to the current seventh replenishment. The Global Fund is seeking 18 billion or 6 billion per year. That's actually a 50% increase, uh, not a 30% a increase, a 50% a increase required from major donors. And some have pre-announced that, which is extremely helpful because it encourages everybody else. And they include Germany, Japan, Luxembourg, and very significantly the USA. Uh, or uh, as we lead up to the replacement conference in New York, all eyes are on France and the UK. And of course, in the case of the UK, the answer may be, sorry, we can't give you an answer. And the UK has lost the Queen and gained a Prime Minister. And the idea that on September the 19th, they can make a large commitment to the Global Fund is, I think, unlikely. So they're probably going to say, we'll come back to you. Which illustrates an important thing about these replenishment cycles. Even beyond the pledging conference, pledges are increased, modified. Um, it doesn't all stop when everyone goes home from the pledging conference. And the UK is quite entitled to say, hang on, we'll come back to you in October or November when we've uh, got our act together and know what we can do. Um, France also very significant, haven't yet heard a number from them. And in the background, always the US ratchet, um, which is incredibly important. The US has committed two for the coming year and it indicatively committed six for the three years. And that challenges everyone else to provide the other two thirds. So the US is putting in six, everyone else has to put in uh, two thirds of the total of 18. Everyone else has to put in 12 to make the total 18. Or by year, the US is putting in two and everybody else collectively has to put in an additional four to make up the six per year. And that's been a powerful mechanism for, I think, increasing total global fund resources. And uh, it really, puts the pressure on other donors if the US comes in early and high, which they have done in most rounds. Um, if the other donors don't come up with the remainder, i.e. the remaining 12 for the three years, then the US contribution will be reduced so that it stays not above 33%. And that sort of uh, it, it's tantamount to giving money from the Global Fund back to the US government, which nobody, including the other governments, want to do. So it does provide a strong incentive. Next slide, please. Just a very quick reflection. Uh, I'll be brief here. I was thinking about what events in the early life of the Global Fund 
that easily might not have occurred have turned out to be very significant in the success and growth of the Global Fund. And I call out too, uh, the Bush administration and its early ownership and large contribution to the Global Fund uh, during a Republican administration has had great impact through to today in terms of creating the bicameral, bipartisan consensus in Washington in support of the Global Fund. And then secondly, France, starting off as the intellectual leader under Jacques Chirac, uh, but through Chirac and Sarkozy and Hollande and Macron, um, France has maintained this very strong supporting position with the Global Fund and remains the second largest donor to the Global Fund. Again, something that easily might not have been the case and had it not been the case, um, would have set back the Global Fund significantly. And so to the last slide, please. So what next? Well, first, of course, the pledging conference scheduled for New York uh, on September 19. But that's the day of the Queen's funeral, as you may have noticed. And so Biden will be in London and so will many other heads of state. So it's going to have to be rescheduled. And that's proving difficult, not surprisingly, but it will be rescheduled. So on some date to be determined in New York or elsewhere will be the pledging conference. And also the first order of business is to, um, going forward, is to assess the outcome of that conference and how close to the 18 billion or at the 18 billion did the Global Fund arrive and what's the impact of that on the strategy and the goals of the work program. But also important, I think, in the next year and beyond, is the growing conviction, which I strongly share, that the Global Fund should be a major conduit for investments in pandemic preparedness. And as many of you may know, the G20 is working with the World Bank to create a large trust fund of money to invest in low-income and middle-income countries on pandemic preparedness. Um, but you could have that money sitting in the trust fund Getting it spent flexibly, rapidly, effectively is a whole other ball game. And the Global Fund has emerged as one of the more plausible conduits for channeling that money to where it's needed and making sure that pandemic preparedness is strengthened and built up. So I think that's a major discussion and exciting opportunity in the months and years ahead. And we'll hear a lot more about that. For those on this call, of course, it's, it's, it's obvious and self-evident that the kind of capacity and infrastructure that you need to fight HGB and malaria is exactly what you also need to be prepared for the next pandemic, um, whatever it may, may be. So that sort of shared capacity and infrastructure requirement uh, makes it uh, an ideal marriage, I think, with the Global Fund. So thank you very much. I will stop there and pass back to Alison. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, I do hear some ringing in the background. I think that might be coming from your uh, your Zoom, uh, Richard. Uh, so just flagging that in case there's there's a buzz, a ring you can switch off. Um, but thank you so much to Richard for uh, the really fascinating insights into the past, present, and and uh, a future of the Global Fund. Um, as I always say, I really believe you should write a book. Um, I was really struck by the early influencers uh, that that sort of you know reached a tipping point to launch the Global Fund. I was also struck by um, uh, malaria and TB really riding on the the coattails of HIV, uh, especially in the context of today, where uh, malaria and TB responses are are majority majority funded by the Global Fund. Uh, that's a, a sort of fascinating start to to. Uh, and, and hard to think about the counterfactual if uh, if there was no HIV epidemic. Um, I'm also struck by the peer pressure on the global stage uh, that that plays into the the global fund uh, replenishments. Um, so thank you, thank you once once more for those those insights. Um, I, I am 
very grateful. I learned a lot, and I'm sure others on this uh, seminar did as well. Um, I, I do want to just recognize a couple other distinguished guests who have joined us over the course of the, the seminar so far, including Tim Tahane, a former Minister of Health, uh, Finance, excuse me, from Lesotho, and uh, a former advisory board to the Global Health uh, Advisory Board member for the Global Health Group, as well as Diana Misham from the uh, formerly from the Gates Foundation, Martin Collier from the Glazer Progress Foundation, and Sarah Anderson from the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. So welcome to you all um, alongside our, our IGHS leadership. So uh, to kick us off, uh, we, we, I would like to, to raise a question to you, Richard, that came from uh, Dr. John Chimambua, who's the, uh, as you know, the, the executive director of the Elimination 8 uh, in Southern Africa. Um, and uh, John, John posed a question to you. So uh, let's start there. And uh, to others on the line, feel free to put uh, questions that you may have in the Q&A box, or uh, feel free to raise your hand as well if you would like to ask your question live, and Robert can uh, help uh, put, put you in speaker mode so you can, you can ask that question live. So first to John's question for you, let me just bring it up here on my screen. So from John, he says, looking back from the early years of the audacious idea and the principles it stood for, fast forward to today, do you still feel the global community is sticking to the original simple goals of a short chain to resources to the community level? Or do you see the Global Fund drifting towards emphasis on processes and being lost therein or behaving like a quote donor unquote? What can the global community do to stick to the simple ideals upon which the global fund was set up? Richard, over to well, you like to respond to that. Yes, briefly. Um, thank you, John. That's an excellent question and would require many hours to fully get into, as you know. Um, I think there is an agenda there and I think the global fund th thinks there's an agenda there also. Um, it's very easy to slip into a kind of more traditional donor behavior in terms of you know, the transaction costs at the country level and various other issues. I think as the pandemic preparedness discussion goes forward, those issues will be on the table as necessary reforms and improvements in global fund processes. And I think if we combine the adoption of pandemic preparedness with a real commitment to make this a post-colonial global public goods financing entity, there's a real opportunity there. But work to be done, I think you're right. Thank you, Richard, and thanks, John, for that question. Another question for you from Amanda Chung from the Malaria Elimination Initiative. Uh, Amanda asks, um, she, she comments that China seems noticeably absent from contributions toward the replenishment. Do they contribute at all? Also, there seems to be a big difference between the pledge and contributions for 2020 to 2022. Is that COVID related or something else? Well, on China, I mean, China in the early years of the Global Fund, and certainly throughout my tenure at the Global Fund, China was a major recipient. So the Global Fund made huge investments in China in HIV, TB, and malaria. Um, China then graduated from eligibility and has been a, a modest donor there's a figure on one of the slides, uh, 80 something million, if I remember, uh, that China has contributed. But you signal a very good point, I think, to, uh, particularly as we move towards a, a more global public goods way of working, uh, China should be uh, a much bigger financial contributor to the work of the Global Fund. And I think that's uh, on the cards for the future. Your second part, I'm sorry, could you just mention it again? Um, she's wondering about the discrepancy between the pledge and the contributions oh, yes. Yes. in terms yes. of the latest replenishment. Yes, and I can't give you a good answer on that. I'd, I'd have to find out. The, the Global Fund, up until that replenishment, number six, the Global Fund had an incredibly good track record of pledges turning into reality, if you like. Uh, what I pledge, I, I give. Um, there seems to be a large discrepancy on um, replenishment six, whether that's a timing issue or a real, a real problem in pledges not turning into actually money in the post, um, I don't know. Um, I, I would have to dig around on that. 
Great. Thank you very much, Richard. And thanks, Amanda, for that question. Um, a few other questions coming through for you. Um, firstly, from um, Mike Reed, uh, director of our Center for Preparedness, Pandemic Preparedness and Response. Um, thank you, Mike. He, he would be grateful to hear from you, Richard, on how Global Fund funding is leveraged to enhance domestic investments in health and to what extent those levers are effective in mobilizing domestic resources. Yes, well, thank you, Mike. And thank you for your recent editorial in The Lancet about these matters, very, very powerful. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's long been an important principle for the Global Fund, the Global Fund money not alone finance a particular program, but the, the, be co-financed between the government and the Global Fund and possibly others, depending on the country and the donor array. Um, and there's been a lot of work over the years to make more uh, analytical and more real that co-financing requirement. Where that stands in detail uh, right now, I don't know. Uh, but it is always a challenge to turn a paper commitment by the government of Malawi, shall we say, to co-finance a particular percentage um, into that, that those monies being really and genuinely available. Um, so a, a challenge uh, and um, related somewhat to the problem of substitution by ministers of finance, which also is an ongoing challenge. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, a question from Sage Nintilaganti, a uh, colleague from the Clinton Health Access Initiative. He writes, it was mentioned that pandemic preparedness could or should be prioritized as an area of focus for the Global Fund going forward. In thinking about the most effective long-term sustainable investments for vert vertical programs and pandemic preparedness, could Richard and others comment on if the Global Fund could serve as a financing aggregator for health system strengthening efforts to integrate community health workers, the general health workforce, and invest in supply chain, health financing reforms, et cetera. Thank you, big question. Um, yes, I mean, uh, in, in a sense, important, important work to be done to move in that direction. Um, Nobody wants to fund vertical programs that are uh, separate from the broader need of strengthening the health system. Um, and finding that, that diagonal balance, as Heine Sepulveda has called it, uh, between specific aims and objectives and a broader strengthening of the healthcare system, um, that's, that's an ongoing search in many, many countries. And, I think pandemic preparedness does potentially move the Global Fund a big step in that direction because it's clearly system-wide investment rather than HITB and malaria-specific investment. Thank you, Richard. Um, Corrine, I'd like to turn it to you uh, for any reflections or comment that you may have from your position leading the RBM partnership to end malaria. And, and as a commissioner for the Lancet Commission on Malaria Eradication, of course. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So maybe first of all, to the last two questions that were addressed to uh, Richard. Uh, in terms of domestic funding, uh, with the global funds, there is the counterpart uh, funding mechanism where uh, uh, endemic countries have to give a, a certain proportion of the, the funding. And I think for countries that are doing well, they, they even contribute to 15% uh, to the global fund uh, based on their funding allocation. And we have seen that recently we have organized the Kigali Malayan NTD Summit, where endemic countries have pledged to, 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 to give 2.2 billion of US dollar as part of domestic uh, financing to the global fund. Of course, this is for the, 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 the cycle that will, will be ending, but I think this is a really good sign and uh, it's really signaled the leadership and commitment, commitment that African countries um, have 
So in terms of the, the global funds, uh, uh, it's true that the global funds uh, was needed. It's really a proof of uh, solidarity from uh, countries, but it's really also uh, quite important to emphasize that the Global Fund has also supported uh, strengthening and build strong health system uh, in countries. I can give the example of Rwanda because when you look at, for instance, the lab, the lab laboratory system that we are using uh, to, 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 to test COVID, th those are PCR machines that will procure for the HIV, uh, with the HIV funding. Similarly, as the community health workers, community health workers were established using the malaria uh, funding, but community health workers are the ones who are also uh, testing, treating malaria, pneumonia, diarrhea. So I think the global funds, based on the country priorities and country needs, uh, they, they, they are also supporting. And uh, I'm sure that part of the 18 billion that are uh, needed for the, 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 the upcoming replenishment, 30% will be allocated to uh, the health system strengthening. So we, we are also having uh, improvement in terms of the health uh, information system. Those are also examples of how the Global Fund is uh, really supporting country to strengthen the, the health system. So uh, for me, the, it's really important that we meet the target, the 18 billion target for the seventh replenishment. Of course, uh, we are waiting for big donors, uh, uh, UK, the UK and France, it's really important so that uh, the matching uh, that the US will be given uh, will be uh, also uh, uh, complete. So I think it's, uh, this is basically my message. And for us, for malaria, the Global Fund is among the most significant uh, funding uh, partner. So they're funding more than 42% of all the malaria programming that goes to country. So it's really important for, 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 for the malaria community, as I'm here as a rollback malaria, to really um, mobilize. And uh, the, the, the last words for me, it's, uh, we need also African voices. So we are seeing many voices that are really uh, calling for the global fund replenishment. It's really important that African voices also are heard because when you look at the global fund, more than 74% of the money goes to African countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corinne, for that that uh, that call to action and reinforcement of the importance of this replenishment and also your insights into the health system strengthening aspects of the global fund investment. And I think we all saw that too with COVID, that a lot of the sort of infrastructure that was established through global fund investments were leveraged for the, the COVID response across countries. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much for those that contribution. Richard, did you want to reflect on uh, Corrine's words? I know that Haile um, will, will also say a, a couple of words of reflections. No, no, only thank you, Corrine, and fully agree with what you say. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, Haile DeBoss, over to you uh, to, to share a couple of your reflections. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Uh, I just want uh, to reflect on Richard's role because it really was very significant. Uh, I remember at the beginning, uh, there was a lot of tension between the creation of the Global Fund and WHO. And uh, it was necessary to bring somebody who can handle all the tension. And, and Richard's leadership was absolutely essential. Uh, he launched the fund, he created, a, he recruited talented people and had a very eff efficient office. I think his role is also in, in raising the funds. It took a lot of work. I know because I used to communicate with Richard. He was here, he was there. 
He was begging for money from this government, from that government. It was, it was really remarkable. And once the money came, I think it was necessary to ensure that the distribution was fair and that it was, uh, uh, that corruption was minimized. Uh, and I think uh, that was a lesson for everybody. Uh, and, and also it ensured that the money had the desired impact. Thank you, Haile. Here, here. I, uh, I, I, I'm noticing the time uh, with just a minute left at the hour. So I, I very much appreciate your remarks. Um, thank you. And I think that it's important to recognize uh, Richard's role in that. So thank you very much. And to be continued, uh, there's a lot to say um, and a, a lot of reflections on, on, on Richard's role and the role of the Global Fund over time. Um, but just, just noting the time, I do want to turn it back to Richard for any uh, final reflections, and then I'll, I'll close the, the seminar. No, just to thank everyone who's been with us this morning. A big thank you, Heidi, for your very generous remarks and all your support in those early days. And um, I hope we'll continue these debates. There's much to talk about here, and it, it, it matters. Thank you all. Thank you all uh, so much for being here. Thanks, Sir Richard, for the fantastic and insightful talk. Um, this has been recorded, so we will be sharing the recording around uh, for those who wish to listen and for those who weren't able to join. Um, thank you once again to Jaime Sepulveda, George Rutherford, and others, leadership of the IGHS, and, and to all for, for joining us today. We really appreciate it and look forward to uh, many more debates in, in the future. So take care and all the best. <laughs>